Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for perking up the weather in New York for my visit, because you know Chicago is like, ah, it's probably a toss-up between who has worse weather uh, during the winter. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Loyola's journey uh, with DACA and kind of how we got started, um, our mission, how that integrates with our mission, and then some of the logistics um, of <coughs> DACA. So here's some disclosures. I don't have anything to disclose. So our journey with this begins with my colleague, Mark Krzyzewski, uh, receiving an email from another Jesuit asking about medical school prospects for a student um, at another Jesuit school. The student had really, really good credentials, was a pre-med double major, and then said to Mark, you know, they don't have authorized status, they're a dreamer. And so this sort of opened the door for Mark to start kind of looking into it. So if you're not familiar, the DREAM Act, so a lot of people confuse DACA and the DREAM Act, and they're two different things. So the DREAM Act was originally introduced by Senator Durbin and uh, Senator Hatch in 2001. And there's been different iterations of it. More people have joined. It's been introduced multiple times, and we haven't been able to get it through. But it's been a, a, a proposal to reform immigration to provide a pathway to citizenship um, for um, alien minors. And it was not successful. But many students. Um, I've been going to school in the DREAM Act in their respective states. So there are state versions that allow students to pay in-state tuition if they've gone K through 12 there. So it allows them to access education without having to pay very, very unreasonable fees. So why was the student interested in Stritch? Well, obviously, she was competitive for medical school. She had overcome extraordinary life circumstances. There was definitely a value added of diversity and then a social justice aspect that fits with our mission for patients and for her as an individual and a learner. But she could not find a way to attend until Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals um, became a reality in June. So what is DACA? So it's a program that is a stay of deportation. The Deferred Action is Deferred uh, Action of Deportation that allows students to get a work permit, an authorization, um, and a social security number. And there are age and residency requirements. You have to be born after a certain date. It is renewable. Um, it's restricted only to students who um, have clean records. Uh, there are certain things that are, that are um, not eligible for that, but you have to have, obviously, a clean, a clean background, pay a fee, and register. And it's administered through um, the US Customs and Immigration Service, so not, not the State Department. So dreamers of DACA status, there are many. So 1.2 to 2.1 million potentially eligible, eligible, and top states, as you can see, Illinois, California, Texas, New York, and Florida. Um, lots of different nations of birth. And again, an executive action that basically just created a temporary state. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily a status. Um, so I want to say a little bit about my journey um, with, with DREAMers and undocumented students total. So when I was a program coordinator and I was running an undergraduate research program as part of a health professions pipeline, we had to do some creative things to fund one of our students. And um, I was a very young employee at the time. And I kept asking my director, like, what should I do and how do I do this? And then later it sort of came out that this student was undocumented and that's why we had to be creative in getting her uh, a research stipend. So I knew that there were, that there were students. And we had the DREAM Act um, in Utah at the time that Senator Hatch pushed through for us. I met an expert in graduate school. I was doing my PhD who was a national expert on college access for high school to undergraduate college admissions. Um, she was part of the National Association of College Admissions Counselors who wrote a manual on making college accessible for undocumented students, um, and is a huge advocate that's been nationally recognized. So I learned a lot more about the issues and the challenges um, from this close colleague of mine. And in 2010, um, I met uh, Cynthia Sanchez, and she is my student zero. And I like to talk about you know, who is your student zero for issues that you became passionate about, for things that you weren't aware of until a student gifted you with um, confiding in you about something that was a challenge that you needed to change about the institution. Um, and Cynthia is, is my student zero, and she came up to me after a pre-med fair presentation that I'd given in Denver, uh, where she was living at the time, and said, I want to go to medical school. You know, I'm undocumented. What are my options? What can I do? So we had this conversation, and I said, well, you know, even if you find a way to get through medical school, you won't be able to complete residency because residency is a job. It's funded by the feds. There's no sort of you know, way you, can, you could do residency and licensure. And she said, I, I can't really worry about all that. I'm just trying to get my next step in place. All I know is this is what I really want to do with my life. Like, are you going to help me or are you not going to help me? 
And she showed me a spreadsheet. She had called every single school, asking them who would take undocumented students and who wouldn't, and had a short list. And I said, um, I'll learn more about this. I'm going to do what I can. Let's just keep in touch. I went back to Chicago, and she actually ended up moving there with one of the professors who transferred from University of Denver to University of Chicago, and, and she was a nanny for that professor, so she ended up in the same city, and we began to work together. And then I met Nu and Denise, who are the founders of PhD, and they came to my office, and we had Thai food, and we talked all about this issue, and they offered me so much uh, insight around what the challenges were, what we needed to do on the medical school side. I asked them, like, what's your wish list for, for how we can increase this access? And we got to work um, starting on getting uh, things recognized in the AMCAS application, getting um, DACA students eligible for the FAP, getting DACA on the ERAS application, and trying to work to integrate systems that students were interacting with. Um, and that inspired me further that there was this whole network of students um, I was privileged to advise a cohort of applicants via Skype that year, so they had monthly meetings, and it was like Hollywood squares of like awesome students all in like their dorm rooms and at home, and they would ask questions um, around different schools and just strategies with regard to applications, and we spent time on the phone um, doing that, and it was just very rewarding for me. And then finally, just in my own identity and history and purpose, with everything that's happening in immigration um, in our world now, I am a descendant of Japanese immigrants who were interned during World War II, whose rights were taken away, the, you know, one of the greatest civil rights debacles in our country's history that we don't talk about very often. And educational access was not promised um, for, for my family, and so I think about what that means is my identity as an ally and that it is my job uh, to keep these doors open. And I, my grandfather left me a set of, of rules that he lived by, um, and I have it in a poster on my wall. And I really consider that to be um, the Bible of how I live my life. And he was very much about um, giving people of the benefit of the doubt and doing things for yourself. Don't expect people to do things that you can do for yourself. And so I look at that initiative um, and I try to incorporate that purpose into my work. So there are a lot of students, 741,556 individuals who've been approved for DACA, and this is since June, so I actually think I need to update this. Denise has told me I need to update this. So more than uh, 1.2 million um, DACA recipients in the United States. For Loyola, when we opened our doors, we wanted to welcome DACA students through the front door. We didn't want to have a hush-hush initiative. We didn't want to do a sort of secret, secretive thing. And so our dean at the time, um, Linda Brubaker, had a, a press conference um, with Senator Durbin and the students that we'd welcomed. We updated our eligibility. We created an inquiry um, um, email on our site to answer questions. Our current students were very instrumental as leaders in preparing our community to be educated about what this means and to receive current students. They presented posters at um, AMC meetings and regional meetings. They wrote um, editorials and published them within the community to educate um, our student staff and faculty around what does it mean to be accepting DACA students. It was a really great teachable moment within the life of our school and has pushed us to discuss immigration issues as they relate to health um, in a much broader and more robust way to integrate within our curriculum. We have trainings around kind of know your rights and how to be an ally for undocumented patients. What are the services that they are eligible for? How can we um, help as future leaders in medicine for their access. So there was, there was a, a big benefit uh, for us to be doing this um, in, in a really open way. So for funding, this was a big challenge, and I have to say that all of this happened through the sheer grit and determination of Dr. Brubaker. Um, she and Mark Krzyzewski really tried to rub elbows and get in the room with as many people as they could to find uh, loans that were very similar to service loans for our students. So we provide scholarship for the cost of living and then our, our loan partners provide the loans. Um, they're secured for four years. And the first set of loans we did through the Illinois Finance Authority, and they were actually available to any undocumented student going into health professions, whether it would be dental, PT, nursing, or medicine in Illinois. But our students were the only ones that took advantage of them for the first year. And then our governorship went from blue to red, and that got stripped out. And they said, okay, well, we had budgeted X number through last year. You only use this many. You can have this many, and then there's no more. So we had to find another uh, alternative, and that came forward through um, Trinity Health, which is the corporation that bought our hospital. And through their charity arm, they provided the second half of the loans for our second cohort, 
And then last year, um, the Resurrection Project, which is a larger community conglomerate affiliated with many of the, the Catholic hospitals and charities, um, agreed to fund our loans through a partnership with dispensing them through Northern Trust. And I currently have no funding for the students that I've accepted so far for the class of 2021. So I'm working on um, an international model with MacArthur Foundation, trying to ask some larger foundations in Chicago, like Big Shoulders, that work with um, Catholic educators to see if we can find ways to give our students access to loans. Uh, and that's been really challenging and disappointing to talk to the DACA students that we've accepted and let them know. But um, my policy has always been to be as upfront and transparent as possible to let them know you should be exhausting all your resources, finish the application process at the rest of the schools that you might have applied to, um, be working on trying to secure your own loans um, in the event that we're unable to get something by um, July 1st. And then we also let them know that we would defer them if we can't get funding together and they can't get funding together. I think that, again, um, Cynthia, Denise, and New taught me that like putting some track down towards your goal is better than not. And so many people will say, well, if you can't go all the way to step Z, like why do you even want to do A through L? Because it matters and because that access to education matters and that striving toward your goal, um, having a right to do that uh, is important. And so a lot of people have asked me in the wake of the current political climate, like are we going to change our admissions criteria? And we're not because you know, we did it because of our school's mission and because we care about uh, social justice and access and because what it brings to our community uh, would be a huge loss if we, if we went backwards. So this is just every day we celebrate Educators Out Day at Stritch and we get our signs, we put them up and we do a group photo. So this is from a couple of years ago. But this is a really kind of all hands on deck, everyone on board thing at Stritch. It's not just a couple of people. So these are folks that are basic scientists and deans, um, administrators from the fourth floor that are uh, very proud to support uh, our students. And in the, in the front uh, is, is Dr. Brubaker right by the banner. So. So here are some stats um, about DACA at our school. We've been tracking it um, since 2014 when it was a write-in status on the MCAS application. It became official as a pull-down option that you could sort for in 2015 um, and, and beyond. So we've gotten a, a significant portion of the nationally available pool applying to us. Um, and most of our students tell us that they Googled undocumented medical school and we're the, first <laughs> we're the first option. So it was funny, we were sharing stories the other day and all of them said, yeah, and then I Googled, like, how am I gonna go to medical school? I'm undocumented and there's this article about Loyola. So we have students from literally all over the US that found us through Google. Um, we've accepted, like I said, a, a number of students and matriculated several. Right now I have 10 who are holding seats, um, three with additional accepts at other um, universities. So we'll see. Um, like you heard in the introduction, we are training 46% of the current trainees in allopathic medicine. Two have since adjusted their status, um, which is another thing to really be aware of and another reason not to peel back your eligibility requirements for students who are eligible for DACAs. Um, of the students I've currently accepted, one is pending an adjustment, another one is working on an adjustment that thinks they might be able to get through. But there's a significant portion of this population that are eligible for um, adjusting their status in some way. Um, we do have that largest population, and I think we've had to build out a lot of our resources. Um, I like to talk about this in terms of structural justice, that students are able to walk in and pull a lever and expect service or expect the school to be able to meet their needs. And we had to do some adapting for this, like adding um, an EAD upload to our student database. We keep track of the expiration date for that. So in case they get really harried and they forget that they need, we want to make sure that they're doing their renewals on time. We added to our pre-matriculation packet when the registrar confirms people's identity, which documents people can use, and just added it as an option of the things that you could bring in so it was just not a big deal so students didn't have to be, um, you know, sort of wear a, hey, I'm DACA on the first day of school if they don't want to. Not everyone at Stritch knows um, who our DACA students are, and not all of them are really out. Um, there are varying degrees of comfort with that, and we have a, a partnership meeting that we offer every month that Dr. K sponsors. And it, we talk about research. We've done media training, because many of them get media inquiries and have wanted to publish blogs. We've had students do everything from videos and um, you know, documentaries with The Atlantic where they're really, really out and forward and students write things for HuffPost. And then some students only come to partnership meeting and some students don't come to partnership meeting at all. And uh, we offer that as, as a it's kind of a buffet of support of what are the things that are going to support you. And 
I was feeling kind of bad that we didn't have everyone coming to partnership meeting and kind of wondering if there was something about our climate or is this indicative of something that we're not doing. And one day, one of our students who um, doesn't come to anything related to when we send out, we, we leave everyone on the emails unless they ask to be removed, but he um, doesn't come. And he came in and he said, you know, Dr. Nakai, I just want to thank you. I am really glad to be here. I'm sorry I don't come to any of the partnership meetings. And then he just broke down and he said, for all my life, I've just never really been able to even admit that this is part of, of my experience and part of who I am. And I'm so scared that it's going to be taken away. And this was, you know, two years ago before um, we're in the political climate that we are now. And he just, um, he just said, I just, I can't, it, it's not supportive for me to come and, and hang out with everyone. And it's not that I don't, you know, care. And he just really wanted me to know I feel supported. You know, I feel great here. I'm working towards my goals. I'm doing well. Um, but, but these are the reasons why I don't come. And that really helped me sort of see the bigger picture of we have that critical mass. The student knows that the support network is there if needed. But not all students are going to access that support in the same way or need the same things. So countries represented at Stritch, a lot of folks who aren't familiar with undocumented immigrants in the United States are really surprised at the depth of the countries represented in our applicant pool. And we probably have pretty close to national representation um, in ANCAS of the number of countries. But it's not exactly what uh, you might think when you think of undocumented immigrant. Um, we have 17 countries represented among our matriculants. Um, and our, our second largest is actually Korea. So that's kind of interesting. Um, students are from all over. And I, and I also have to say, there's a lot of intersectionality of identity among our students. We have students who are DACA, who are LGBT, who are also underrepresented. Um, we, there's a lot of different identities that they carry. And I think we feel that we've achieved the benefit of critical mass because they are integrated into the class in a way that some of them are president of LMSA, and some of them are doing PHR, and some of them are doing women in medicine and different specialty clubs. So they do feel that they can exercise all of these sort of aspects of their identities and their interests, not just being only a DACA student. So lots of states represented, um, some friendlier than others. Um, in the wake of the election, I even had some students that were afraid to even travel domestically to go home to either California or Arizona because of the things they were hearing. Um, and that was really hard for me not to be able to offer reassurance um, but to have to really kind of also sit with that reality that you should be okay and you sh these are the things that should hold. Um, we triage that a little bit and have uh, an, an attorney on retainer through the Resurrection Project. That is an emergency number that we sent out to all of our students. If anything happens or you have an incident, your first call is, is you know, to Dr. K, who's kind of our like chief liaison for DACA students, and then your second call would be to this um, attorney, and we would be right there um, to support you and help you. But it. I didn't imagine a year ago that we would be sending um, emails like that, you know, so a lot has really changed. So language abilities. So uh, for the past three cycles that we've been tracking um, undocumented applicants, 98% of them uh, report at least speaking one other language. So this is a big aspect of our mission to treat the last and least, to care for the underserved, to increase access to health and health care for underserved communities. Every student at DACA is at least bilingual. Um, the 10 that we've accepted so far, there's a lot of language capabilities there. Here are the languages and sort of the breakdown by class. Um, and as you can see, the larger class, you know, the class of 2020 speaks 38 languages in and of itself. So within that, you know, you have several of these represented. Um, so it's not just all the DACA students bringing all of the diversity. We have it across uh, the entire student body as well. We have a medical Spanish elective that's peer taught and the only medical Polish elective um, in the country at Stritch as well, because we have a lot of fluent um, Polish speakers that wanted to be able to provide that for their classmates. So here's a picture that we took after we had a reception with the Resurrection Project after last year's um, funding. So that's our, our group of students. Not everyone is, uh, is pictured. Uh, 160 per cohort, yeah. So our mission, as you can see, our mission uh, is very focused on meeting the needs of the underserved, uh, preparing people to lead extraordinary lives, uh, treating the human spirit, encouraging innovation, embracing diversity, respecting life, and valuing human dignity. So opening our doors is pretty congruent with that mission. 
And of course, we're focused on service and stewardship and high impact research. And then the third part of our mission is the Catholic heritage and the Jesuit traditions, um, ethical behavior, scholarly distinction, but also knowledge that advances you know, increasing justice through medicine and health in the communities that we're serving locally and globally. So we try to integrate this across not just our admissions policies, but also our curriculum. Like I said before, opening our doors has improved the school. It's improved the education experiences of all students. I was preparing a blog for the class of 2016 that just graduated and asked them, because they were all second years when we brought in our first cohorts. They never actually had DACA trainees in their class. And I just asked them as a class, you know, if you have thoughts about this, respond to me about how you feel about being at a school um, that was, you know, so open in the first school to really openly accept undocumented students. And I was so surprised and overwhelmed by the responses that I got back that students said, um, I'm proud that I went to a school that did this. Um, I felt like my identities were more supported knowing that my school had stood up for its values for this group of people. So as a gay black man or an underserved, you know, a Latina from an underserved community, I felt more included and welcome at the school because uh, of this expression of values uh, for undocumented students. Um, there was also a lot around, I now think differently about these communities because I've learned in community with someone who has direct experience versus those people over there who in theory, right, it changes when you have a relationship with a person who has grown up without access for different reasons or who's been part of uh, a community of immigrants that's been terrorized by ICE or experienced family separation. And the way that uh, one student actually said, understanding that immigration can be a huge source of trauma for patients of all ages and families. So the insights that all of our students are gaining from this are, are going to make them better providers. And this is just an example of, of living our values that helps us in terms of justifying like, how are we doing admissions to integrate these things across uh, the school. So here's another picture of some of our students. This was on a trip that they took. Uh, we changed some of our Ignatian Service Immersion offerings to be inclusive of all students because not everyone can leave the country. So this is another example of how we had to adapt some of our programming to make sure that it was fairly accessible. So now we have two opportunities through um, either alternative spring break or in the summer to do um, a border, uh, border immersion where they go to the border areas and help um, some of the groups that are trying to prevent death along the border, and another one at um, the Lakota Sioux Indian Reservation in South Dakota. So we have a couple of different experiences that if someone is not able to leave the country, um, it is accessible to them to participate in Ignatian service immersion. So just to talk a little bit more about like the road after medical school, um, it's exciting for us because our first cohort are all rising fourth years now, so we will be sort of looking at, at match outcomes for that group um, in just a year from now. So they can complete a residency. It's why it sort of made sense to move forward because those barriers were lifted. So with their work permit, they can be verified through just a regular I-9 process. Residency programs do not have to um, have sponsorship oversight through the State Department or pay the fees that they might have to pay for someone who's on an H-1B or an F-1 visa. And there's a lot of information around the rights that you, would, that you get. You get the same worker protections um, as other workers in the United States. There was a VA issue, so if there are any rumors around restrictions at the VA, um, that's gone away as of February 23rd of, of last year. Um, they are allowed to rotate through the VA. Before this happened, um, Heinz VA is one of our largest partners, and we were just prepared to either put them there and just have them not ask and say, we verified them and it's an affiliation agreement, or try and place them at non-VA sites for their clerkships, which we, we could have done through scheduling. But luckily, this resolved before that became an issue. Um, so licensure. So DACA recipients can meet requirements for licensure, and usually it's, you know, if you completed medical school, or if you're in medical school, you can get your token to sit for the boards. So there weren't any um, issues for previous students that have gone through and, and have gotten licensure. There are restrictions that might apply by state, um, not different to other eligibilities around having a previous um, incidence on your record, mental health. I mean, each state has their own licensure restrictions that are not necessarily different. Um, in talking to residency program directors around uh, access for undocumented students, there's always this sort of, well, there's a risk of X, Y, Z, or what if their status is taken away? And I like to break that down by saying um, every applicant that you're looking at represents risk. 
And there's some where you know what that risk is and there's some that you don't. But the quotient of risk is actually the same because someone could have an illness, someone could have a life earthquake, someone could um, get pregnant and have a baby, someone could turn out to be a bad resident. Like they all know that there are contingencies down the road that you just don't anticipate. And this is another one to sort of throw in there. Is it a reason to disqualify someone who could bring something to your program in terms of talent, their accomplishments, and just their standalone merit as an applicant? Um, I would say no, and I would say that that's unlawful to discriminate against someone in that regard. So we are trying to get the message out. Um, Denise and two other um, students, uh, residents, um, we pub we're publishing a paper very soon in academic medicine around considerations for DACA recipients in GME that kind of lays out some of the guidelines and some of the arguments of considering them fairly. So hopefully that will come out and make a dent in the, <laughs> the wave of students that will be applying um, next season. So. DACA is on the AMCAS and ERAS applications as a, a pull-down status that you can put under um, your, your citizenship area. They are eligible for the fee assistance program, which gives a reduced MCAT and 13 applications through AMCAS. So it just took a little bit of pushing, but AMC has been great in helping us, um, again, make these systems much more structurally just. Um, the goal and sort of the principles of structural justice would be that for every student who goes through, the system is able to meet their needs, rather than having to have a person backfill something or decide that they're going to push it forward. Any kind of manual intervention on the part of, on the part of another person um, outside the system means that it doesn't work and is not structurally just for every user. So we're, we really pushed the AAMC to try and, and add these things in. And they added it on the ERAS application in kind of a funny way. At first we said you really need to add this because you don't, you don't have an option that, that is true for people who are applying. Like are you a visa holder, you're a permanent resident or a citizen? Well, you're none of the above. They came back to us and they said, well, it's too hard for us to change the database. We can't do it. It's, we're looking at like 18 months. And so I called and I spoke to someone and I said, this is essentially a precursor to an employment application on which an applicant has to attest to the veracity and it is the only way to apply for said job. So you are forcing my candidates to lie. I don't really think you want to do that because their contract is based on them being truthful. And literally like the next day they're like, oh, we fixed it, we put it in. So you know, sometimes you have to apply a little pressure in the right places to get people to understand the implications because not everyone who's in charge of a system understands the downstream and the pre-stream effects of what it is they're doing. So it's been a lot of kind of education um, of stakeholders. And then of course, schools considering applicants of um, DACA status, which I shouldn't have status there, uh, is listed in the MSAR. So the medical school admissions requirements, you can go through a database. There is a list of schools that will consider um, DACA recipients. And that was just huge, right? Remember Cynthia, student zero, who had to call every single school. And you may or may not get someone who understands what that means. You may or may not get the right answer. So this is sort of the AMC pushing schools to say, say yes or no. Um, we'd like for them to also add, do you have a funding mechanism? Um, because that's the next barrier of a lot of students who have a seat, um, but no funding mechanism to be able to attend. So a couple of resources here, um, Pre-Held Dreamers, obviously United We Dream, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and there's national coalitions for that as well, and then Educators for Fair Consideration, um, focusing on undocumented students, who is the larger kind of parent organization of, of Pre-Held Dreamers. And a few references. So with that, I will open it up to questions. <laughs>